Good morning. It's good to see you. I hope this new day finds you and your soul at peace. My name is Leon Dunkley. I minister to the North Universalist Chapel Society in Woodstock, Vermont. Uh, it's so good to be together. It's good to see you. I'm glad that you've joined us this morning. Today's is Sunday, May the 3rd in 2020, and this morning's reflection is entitled Freedom and the Flip Side. To this service and to this good May day, I bid you welcome. To all souls, I say good morning. It is good to be together. Way across the waters, on the other side of the world, things were looking, at least for a time, downright bizarre. The Guardian reported that in Wellington, New Zealand, it felt downright bizarre in the early stages of the COVID crisis, as people took exaggerating arcs on the footpath to avoid each other while near-empty buses sped by. The article further reported that by the time they locked down in Italy, it was too late. Hundreds of people there had already died of COVID-19 with thousands infected. Over the next two weeks, the death toll soared. In New Zealand, we have oddly been in an opposite position. No one has died from the virus, and seven people are in the hospital but they are not in intensive care or on ventilators. The first case of coronavirus in New Zealand was reported on February 28th. A state of emergency was, it was declared 26 days later. And now they are reporting that they are out of the woods after 1,500 confirmed cases nationwide and only 19 deaths, lockdown restrictions are being lifted. In the US, it's been very different like Italy, we waited a little bit too long to act. Our first case of COVID-19 was reported on the 20th of January. We waited 53 days, not like New Zealand's 26, to, de to declare emergency, 53 days. Once we did, our lockdown restrictions across the country were inconsistent. That put us in a tougher spot. But bravely, we are responding to the best of our ability, each to our gift. We are trying to make good sense in these difficult times, but half the time, it seems like making good sense just can't be done. There's too much grief. Few of us are made to process grief at volumes as high as this, so we're overstressed, each and every one of us. And of course, we're acting out in the strangest of ways, sometimes trying to reach for something certain, even if, even if we have to make it up. Resent, resenting the very restrictions that are saving lives by the thousands, becoming angry at a virus that utterly disregards our rage. So I'm not surprised that we are protesting so bizarrely. Yet, we, it is because we don't yet have an empowered way to process our grief. But it is coming. Surely it is. The wisdom we need, the worldly wise wisdom that can make good sense of things is coming from far away, perhaps from places like Wellington, New Zealand, on the other side of the world and across the sea. Breathe deep, have patience, open your hands, your hearts, your eyes, your minds, your spirits, your souls. Over oceans, the wisdom will arrive like music, like laughter, like so many waves to the shoreline, like the simple joy of being here and alive. Our opening hymn this morning is Sound Over All Waters. Would you please rise in body and spirit and join in the singing.
before we get into joys and concerns, I need to share a, a story with you about the sacred joy of being Nawanda. Uh, do you know who Nawanda is? Here's a hint. There was a, a red lightning bolt emblazoned upon his chest. Now, I imagine that some of you might be nodding your heads. Nawanda was the secret Dead Poet Society code name for a young man named uh, Charles Dalton. He was a good man, a good student, at a stuffy New England prep school. Uh, are, you, are you familiar with the film, uh, Dead Poet Society? Uh, it's one of my favorites. Ethan Hawke, Robin Williams. Uh, it's a great one to watch during this lovely lockdown that we're having. So uh, with more humor uh, than was advantageous for him, Dalton, uh, Charles Dalton, this Nwanda character, resisted institutional authority with all of his might. Uh, he thought that uh, he thought for himself. He was an independent thinker. He had a good teacher, Mr. Keating, who taught him all he needed to know. Keating uh, had led a poetry class, and he took his poetry class outside, and he was marching his students around the courtyard, having them sing, chanting responsively, I don't know, but I've been told, I don't know, but I've been told, doing poetry is cold, doing poetry is cold, left, 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 right, left, halt, he said. Thank you, gentlemen. If you've noticed, when we started off, we were all on our own stride. We were all walking at our own pace. Uh, Mr. Keating was trying to demonstrate the pressures of conformity. He continued, the difficulty of maintaining your own beliefs in the face of others. We all have the need for acceptance, but you must trust that your beliefs are unique and your own. Even though others may think them odd or unpopular, Robert Frost said, two roads diverged in a yellow wood and I took the one less traveled by and that has made all of the difference. I want you to find your own walk right now, your own way of striding, pacing, any direction, anything you want, whether it's proud or silly or anything. Charles Dalton or Nawanda was not participating in the exercise and Mr. Keating noticed. And he asked, Mr. Dalton, will you be joining us? Okay. Uh, and without getting up, the young man replied, I am exercising the right not to walk. And this answer pleased them both. Sometimes you have to swim against the stream. I light a candle this morning for doing just that. And for your information, a virtual healing circle has been planned for uh, this Wednesday uh, May the 6th at 7 o'clock. Please check the, check the North Chapel webpage for information about it. Uh, for those of you who may not know about this, Healing Circle is a public prayer of witness and compassion that we do here at North Chapel. Uh, it is a prayer to honor that which is hurting and healing in our lives. We gather in song and we gather in silence to share what is in, on our minds. So please join us if you are so inclined. This is the time in our service for the sharing of joys and concerns. If you have a joy or concern in your heart, I invite you to share them at this time. Right now, let's call out what is within our hearts and let's send our good light over to North Chapel. Let's let our joys and concerns combined like separate winds to gather into a single sail, breathing in and breathing out, breathing out and breathing in. This morning, I have seven joys and seven concerned candles to share with you. The first is for Nwanda. Actually, there are six, six of them. The first is for Nwanda, uh, the guardian angel of thinking for oneself. Uh, the next four candles are for Allison, William, Sandra Lee, and Jeffrey, and I will explain who they are later in the service. And the sixth candle is for the ongoing ache that we all share. The tired shoulder weight that we carry around these days, may we soon be free of it. For all the joys and for all the joy, sorrows that have been spoken and for those that remain within the silent sanctuary of our hearts, may we be forever grateful for these days we spend together. 
these days that have our names written upon them. For this, I will light one more candle. May we hold all of this in compassionate community as we enter a time of meditation and prayerfulness. This morning, I would like to begin with the words from a song. Uh, I have quoted these words before. It is poetry from a man named Michael McDonald's. It's a piece uh, called Here to Love You. And the words are these. He writes, I've heard it said that the weight of the world's problems is enough to make the ball fall right through space, that it ain't even worth it to live with all that's going wrong. But let me just go down to saying that I'm glad to be here here with all the same pains and laughs that everybody knows. Now, some men think they're born to be king, and maybe that's true. But I think passing love around is all that we were born to do. So let them build their kingdoms. Let them make the laws for this world to heed. 
because you and I make life worth living right here in each other's arms. I'm here to love you. I love that song. Uh, I'm, I'm here to love you. Um, the last line always feels kind of Jesus-y to me uh, in a mischievous kind of way. Uh, whenever I hear it and wherever I am, I take it in, I breathe it into my core. Uh, it's like a, sep a secular piece of scripture to me and just as holy. And at the end, uh, the repeating lines recur. Uh, just let me go on loving you. Don't stop me now when I'm feeling this way. That sounds just like a testament of faith in any tradition. Now, I have a confession to make. Uh, I only ever listened to the first side of that album, the Minute by Minute album by the Doobie Brothers. There are five songs on the other side of that album that I rarely ever hear. I don't really listen to. I struggle to remember songs like Open Your Eyes or Steamer Lane Breakdown, a Sweet Sweet Feeling. Uh, one of the songs called Sweet Feeling comes up pretty easily in my memory, but the rest of the songs are kind of lost on me. I don't remember them. I feel guilty about that. I feel bad about that. I, I grew up listening to whole albums at a time. I had an album called Tapestry by Carole King. Uh, I played it on a loop. I had it on an eight-track tape, so it was easy. Do you remember eight-track tapes? Uh, they were like the ancient dinosaurs of the present-day recording industry. Uh, they were big and bulky and cumbersome, and you couldn't really have a big collection of them. Who had the room? Uh, eight-track tapes uh, weren't particularly attractive either, so I didn't have a lot of eight-track tapes, but the good thing was you could play them in an endless loop. I would listen to Carole King all night long sometimes, and I would go to sleep and the music would play and play. I felt the earth move so far away. It was too late and home again. I was beautiful over yonder. It was good to know I had a friend. Where you lead, I would follow. I loved today and loved tomorrow. All of the songs just flowed and mixed together in my dreams. I was in and out of sleep, but over time, I learned the whole album. I learned the album as a whole, and I felt really good about it. There was no song on the album that I did not know and love. You learn the, old, you learn the whole album, soup to, soup to Nuts. That's the way I always thought you had to do it, and I, I've learned otherwise since. But the first feeling has never gone away. I still feel like I should know the whole thing. So I know the A side of the Doobie Brothers album really well. What a Fool Believes, minute by minute, depending on you, don't stop to watch the wheels. And my favorite, Here to Love You. I've memorized the first side of the album, but not the second. I know the A side, but not the flip side. Even though I know for a fact that flip sides are very powerful. Rock Around the Clock by Buddy Holly and the Comets was the B-side, one of the most famous songs in all of rock and roll. It was a B-side, can you believe that? Put your glad rags on, join me, hun. Have some fun when the clock strikes, when we're gonna rock. Okay, it was, it was a B-side. The A-side, uh, the presumed hit on that early Buddy Holly record was the immortal classic, 13 Women and Only One Man in Town. Surely everyone recalls this unforgettable favorite. As funny as it may be, the one and only man in town was me. Thirteen women and me the only man around. I had two girls every morning, seeing that I was well fed. And believe you me, one sweetened my tea while the other buttered my bread. Hard to imagine why that red hot and rockin' treasure escaped my notice. Truly, though, and verily, I say unto you, I'm not surprised that this particular B-side won the day. But it's not the only one. Hound Dog, when it was recorded by Elvis Presley in 1953, was the B-side to Don't Be Cruel. Strawberry Fields, when it was recorded by the Beatles in 1967, was the B-side to Penny Lane. And Do Right Woman and Do Right Man, 
when it was recorded by Aretha Franklin that same year, was the B-side to I Never Loved a Man the Way That I Love You. Now, both of these A's and B's were really neck and neck, but there were others. You, you can't always get what you want. When it was recorded by the Rolling Stones in 1969 was the B-side to Honky Tonk Woman and Maggie May. When it was recorded by Rod Stewart in 1971 was the B-side to Reason to Believe. That B-side was a powerful song. The mandolin intro sounding so sweet and so high with the bass down below anchoring and the double shot from the drum on beats three and four to kick the whole thing off. Uh, uh. Wake up, Maggie, I think I got something to say to you. Oh uh, man, Rod Stewart, his voice back then and even now, raspy, rough, brutal, raw, right clear through to the end. Maggie, I wish I'd never seen your face. And then he lets out this huge hoot that I won't try to emulate. It was awesome. The song is about a devastated young man who had given himself wholly and completely, heart and body and soul, to an older woman, but alas, he was misused by her. It happens. So he's trying to recapture at least a portion of his pride, and probably failing, and he probably knows it. It sounds like an absolute disaster of a relationship, and somehow it's an absolutely wonderful song B-sides, man. You gotta love a good B-side. Of course, the most important B-side for us this morning is the B-side that was recorded by David Crosby, Stephen Stills, Graham Nash, and Neil Young in 1970, the B-side that was called Find the Cost of Freedom. That's where the title comes from, Freedom and the flip side. The song had only one verse, four lines, sung through twice. Find the cost of freedom buried in the ground. Mother Earth will swallow you. Lay your body down. It was simple, really. Unison the first time through, they all sing together. Then three-part harmony on the second time around. It was beautiful. Fifty years ago, those four men, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, demanded something of us. They, they implored us to find the cost of freedom. Today, 50 years later, it's easy to wonder whether or not we actually have, whether or not we have found the cost of freedom. It's strange. In, in 1970, uh, we might not have been able to find the cost of freedom, but we were certainly able to find the cost of incarceration. The Federal Reserve Economic Data Group has made a long-term study of this cost. According to them, the government expenditure for prisons in 1970 was $139 million. The prison system has grown exponentially over the past 50 years. It has grown by approximately 700%. The estimated government expenditure in 2020 is $7.3 billion. That's a lot of VIG. It's a lot of money. That's the cost of prison, but the cost of freedom is both a great deal more than this and absolutely free. Freedom is a great deal more expensive than imprisonment, but its value cannot be measured in dollar signs. You can't count it out in cash. The cost of freedom can only be approximated, given, by, given value by no fine measure, but by the degree to which we appreciate the quality of the lives that we live. Freedom is not a for-profit agency, not in the sense that its revenue can be taxed by the state. To, to calculate the precise economic value of freedom would be a soulless enterprise, and, then, and one that we have done before in the time of American slavery. It was a soulless enterprise then, and it would be a soulless enterprise now. It would be an exercise in futility, biblical in proportion. Jesus, in the Gospel of Matthew, in the parables, asks the question of his disciples. He asks, for what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life or lose their souls? 
the cost of freedom and the value of our escape from soullessness are one and the same. The cost of freedom and the value of our escape from soullessness is one and the same. There is no amount of money that could ever pay for such a thing. That infinite value, that pricelessness, is a spiritual commodity, not a commercial one. It simply cannot be purchased with cash and coin. In fact, it cannot be purchased at all. The soul is not transactional. It is an infinite energy that has been given to us by life's longing for itself. It cannot be taken from us. It can only be given away. Those who want to steal it know full well that it can't be done. So they contrive and they strategize, they conspire and they manipulate. They try their best to convince good people to give their souls away. They try to convince us they are, that, that we are less beautiful than we are. They ask us not to think for ourselves. And when they are successful, we believe them. I celebrated a, a, an anniversary um, 11 days ago on uh, April, oh, actually, I'm not sure what it is, uh, two weeks ago, probably by now. Um, on April 21st in 2012, eight years ago and change, I was ordained in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, Reverend Dr. Rebecca Parker delivered the sermon on that day. She began with the words of the song. Uh, uh, just She began with the words of a song, uh, similarly to what I have done this morning. She said, there were no mirrors in my Nana's house, no mirrors in my Nana's house. And the beauty I saw in everything was in her eyes, like the rising of the sun. The world outside was a magical place. I only knew love, I never knew hate. And the beauty in everything was in her eyes like the rising of the sun. Dr. Parker said, I begin with these words from Issa Barnwell of Sweet Honey and the Rock. She sings of a grandmother whose love enabled a black girl child to know the beauty of the world and the beauty of herself while growing up in material poverty in a world that denied and defied that child's beauty, in a world where then, as now, black children with Skittles in one hand and iced tea in another are hunted down by those who cannot see them." End quote. Black children with Skittles in one hand and iced tea in another. This, of course, is a reference to the tragic murder, murder of Trayvon Martin, a 17-year-old African-American teenager who was killed in Sanford, Florida in a terrible act of violence that had taken place just two months before the ordination service. I would like to think that Trayvon Martin's spirit and the love of his good family was with us in the room that day. Reverend Parker continued, she said, at the end of his essay, The Fire Next Time, after exposing the dynamics of racism, the ways in which humanity is beaten down and torn apart by the devastating exploitations of racial injustice, James Baldwin uh, says, quote, the question remains, what shall we do with all of this beauty? Baldwin evokes the persistence and the resilience of beauty in the face, he, uh, he, 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 he Baldwin evokes the face of the holy shining through human beings, even in the midst of all that we do that defaces one another. Finally, Baldwin's prophetic call is not a call to outrage and pity, which merely demands that the privileged become the paternalistic. It is a call instead to all of us to come together before the sacred altar of beauty and be transformed by the gentle and fierce insistence that that which is lovely not be defiled. The gentle and fierce insistence that that which is lovely not be defiled. If you would, please place your hand on your chest and press down. With a gentle and fierce insistence, feel your own heart beating beneath your breastbone. 
breathe into its life force, its power and majesty. To know the beauty of the, of the world, we must know the beauty of our own hearts, gentle, fierce, and insistent. Beating and repeating its one simple prayer over and over again. Let that which is lovely not be defiled. Fifty years ago, we could not find the cost of freedom, but we knew what it was. We knew its meaning, and its meaning was precise. Fifty years ago, freedom meant marching against Richard Nixon's secret bombing campaign in Cambodia, a military campaign that was designed to claim the lives of tens of thousands of people. Today, we march for different reasons. <clears throat> freedom means something different to us now. Freedom means marching with guns at the ready against COVID-19 stay-at-home restrictions that have been issued by governors in the states of Maine, Michigan, Minnesota, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky, California, Colorado, North Carolina, Virginia, Indiana, Texas, and ironically, in the state of Ohio. Freedom means marching against the medical campaign that is designed to save lives of tens of thousands of people. Somehow we have lost our way a bit. And I wonder to what degree this slow process of, bec this slow process of becoming lost began some 50 years ago in the state of Ohio. This reflection is called freedom and the flip side for a reason. I am a good student of music because I deeply appreciate the B side of things and because the flip side of Find the Cost of Freedom by Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young was a song that was written after a terrible tragedy that took place at Kent State University. Graham Nash told the story to Howard Stearns on TV. He said, Crosby was telling me that he saw Neil's face and that he saw Neil go off into the woods, and Neil came back an hour later and played Ohio. Crosby called me and Stephen. We were in Los Angeles at the time. He said, Neil has written this song, and you're not going to believe it. We've got to get to the studio right away. Stephen and I booked a studio in Hollywood. Neil and David, the engineer, came down. We went into the studio. We cut Ohio, and then we cut the B-side, which was Find the Cost of Freedom. We sent the master to New York, and the single was out on the street in 10 days. These artists had their collective finger on the pulse of a younger generation. They wanted to respond with passion in real time. They wanted to be in the moment. Graham Nash said, we wanted to, what, we wa what we wanted to do was bring it out instantly, now. We were angry now. The kids were angry now. We wanted to speak and scream about this now. They were passionate. Graham Nash concluded his comments by explaining the message of Ohio. He said the message of Ohio was very simple. When the American administration wanted to bomb Cambodia secretly, the news got out and students demonstrated at Kent State University against the bombing in Cambodia. The governor sent out the National Guard foolishly with live ammunition, and the National Guard Guardsmen opened fire on the students and killed four of them stone dead. Allison, William, Sandra Lee, and Jeffrey. The candles that I lit earlier were for them. For Allison Krauss, who was only 19 years old when she died, for William Schroeder, who was 19 as well, for Sandra Lee Shower, and for Jeffrey Miller, who were only 20. The day that those four fell was the 4th of May in 1970, 50 years ago tomorrow at 12.24 p.m. Nash continued talking about the iconic photograph of Miller on the ground and a 14-year-old Marianne Vecchio crying over him. It's a famous photo. It was on the cover of Life magazine. It won the Pulitzer Prize in 1971. With energies of anger and grief and sorrow intertwined, he said so terribly and so painfully, we are killing our own children. And we were killing them in support of a secret policy of slaughter on a massive scale in Cambodia, and the youth were not going to take it. 
They gave their lives to protest it. Kent State was the very essence of the youth movement for me, the very essence of youth saying, this is wrong and I'm gonna say something, even if I may die. And four of them did. That was the story behind Kent State. Ohio was the flip side of find the cost of freedom. They sang, tin soldiers and Nixon coming, we're finally on our own. This summer I hear the drumming for dead in Ohio. Ohio was the flip side of find the cost of freedom and buried in the ground back then were Allison and William, Sandra Lee and Jeffrey, they laid their bodies down. Not 80 years between them, but they taught us something that was ancient. They taught us something that was beyond their years, perhaps beyond our own. They taught us how to find the cost of freedom. They taught us how to live soulfully, how to give life soulfully, how to think for ourselves, how to walk the path of truth and deepest compassion. Now, it's important for us to remember the power of that time. It's important for us to remember that part of those four young Americans, that part of them that still survives in us. 50 years ago, that was a very important time. Neil Young explains this himself. He says it was a time when music was getting a grip in a different way and people were all coming together, musicians and the audience and the movement of youth. Something was being born. We noticed it in the audiences. They were very emotional, very connected. They were coming out against things, having a voice, protesting. Something deep within us is being born. Something deep within us is still being born today. Something is blossoming and it's not too late, not too late. It's right on time. Some buds just need 50 years to flower. It can take a long time before we learn how to see the other side of things, before we learn how to listen to the B side, the flip side. And sometimes the flip side is better. One side of the Doobie Brothers album, the side that I prefer to listen to, starts with the song I love, the one I shared with you this morning. But there's part of, part of it I'm struggling with. There's a part that reads, let them build their kingdoms and let them make the laws for this world to heed because you and I make life worth living right here in each other's arms. When I read this now, it seems like a bit of a retreat. It seems to be saying that so long as we are in love, the makers of the laws and the builders of kingdoms can do as they like. I struggle with that, especially now. I don't think that's true because of the brave example that was set by the prime minister in New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern. She acted at a critical time, she thought, for herself. She acted before the need for restrictions became obvious, before it was too late, and she stopped the spread. She acted when her actions seemed downright bizarre. Maybe that's the flip side to freedom. Having the wisdom enough to know when not to use it. So let's turn to the work of making laws and building king kingdoms, downright bizarre kingdoms that are worldly wise, wise enough to keep us safe. Let's build this within our hearts and within the world in which we live. Stay courageous, may it be so. Blessed be and amen. Zoom, zoom, all day long, all day long, and Sunday's not, Sunday's not, Sunday's not, Sunday's not, Sunday's not, Sunday's Oh
It was okay. That was good. It wasn't good. It was that okay. That was good. Then we're done.